uh, uh, she's on her way. And Diane, you have a way of uh, like signaling us when we have a certain critical mass of people to get going, I assume, or do we just start at the stroke of eight? No, I'll give it a, you know, give it a few minutes. So. And you, you will, you were able to I, see. I can it. chat you in the. Okay. The but you're able to see as people come on. Kind of I keep think so. Up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So. Great. Okay. I'll, I'll click the button now then. Very good. Alive. Good evening or good morning as you are joining us or good afternoon from different parts of the world. Um, we're very delighted by the uh, robust response uh, that we've had to this webinar to discuss both the conditions of the struggle that has emanated around the JSIC Technology Factory campaign starting last August uh, and, and most importantly to uh, focus on what it is possible for people to do if they're interested in trying to promote the labor rights, uh, the academic freedom, and the rights of association for Chinese workers and Chinese students. Um, we will wait for a few minutes uh, before we get going for people to, to join the webinar. Um, so if you have come right on time, we thank you and we just ask you to wait patiently for a couple of more minutes. So I think we will get started. Um, I'm sure people will be continuing to join for a while. Um, my name is Ellen David Friedman. I am going to be hosting the webinar and I first would like to thank uh, Labor Notes for providing this platform for us, um, for doing the outreach that made this webinar possible and thank um, our associate at Labor Notes, Dan DiMaggio, who's handling the technical aspects of this webinar. Uh, let me uh, quickly run over the agenda. We're, this call, we hope, will last uh, one hour. 
And what we hope to accomplish is uh, I will take about five minutes to give, uh, set the context for what we understand by Chinese activism and labor activism at this moment in history. Um, I will have uh, then the, the honor of turning this over to Michael Ma, who is a colleague of ours in Hong Kong um, with the organization um, SACOM, which is Students and Scholars Against Corporate Misbehavior, which has been um, playing a central role in organizing the Solidarity Campaign. And then as a point of personal pride, uh, my son, Eli Friedman, who is a professor at the uh, labor school at Cornell, whose field of research uh, is Chinese labor. Um, Michael is going to give us um, sort of the, uh, the history, the events of the JSIC case. Uh, Eli is going to help us understand what steps people have taken both here and around the world to try and offer a response. And then we would like to give the last uh, half hour of our call for uh, questions and conversation. Uh, please feel free to type questions in either to the text box that you will see on the right hand side of your screen or on the bottom banner of your screen is a Q&A box that can go in either place and we will, uh, hope to take as many, um, you know, as many questions as we can possibly handle. Um, so let me, let me establish a little context for this. Uh, we got to see who the participants were that were registered for this call. It's quite impressive. It includes a, a wide range of people who uh, uh, work in, um, in unions, in academia, grassroots activists, people do international solidarity, some people with quite a long history in the field of China labor, uh, others we have no idea. So um, I will hope to do justice to some of the basic conditions um, that we operate under. Uh, it will be uh, for some of you. Um, uh, China, as I think people know, uh, uh, has a single trade union. It is a, it is a department of the state, the All China Federation of Trade Unions. It does not represent workers in any notion that most of us would have. Its primary function has been historically to organize labor for production purposes. Um, uh, labor uh, organizing in China cannot go on outside of the trade union. Unfortunately, it also cannot go on inside the trade union. Um, as we will see in this uh, the case of the basic struggle, um, and this is not a unique case uh, where workers came to recognize that the conditions of their employment required some response uh, to gain protection from exploitation. They went to the trade union and were told they couldn't be helped and, and uh, then you will hear what happened after that. So the union is really not a factor here. Um, nevertheless, as many of you are well aware, uh, workers do take matters into their own hands and for decades, um, there are every week of the year, every month, year after year, hundreds and hundreds of strikes and forms of labor protest that are not strictly speaking legal or strictly speaking illegal. Um, the, the government often does not respond uh, very repressively um, to a strike unless they are concerned that there are certain features of the strike that may present some trouble for them. Uh, let me just step back for a moment to give a bit of historical context. Um, there was a, a period under the previous uh, leadership in China, uh, the presidency of uh, Hu Jintao, from about 2003 to 2013, which many of us now um, understand to, to have been a period of uh, great liberalism. It wasn't absolutely obvious at the time, but it became very clear once Xi Jinping became president. So up until uh, 2013, there was, um, it was still very constrained, but there was lots of opportunities for students, for workers, either for trade unionists, um, for scholars, researchers, labor journalists, and labor lawyers um, to engage in some inquiry, to, to meet one another, to begin to think about what, uh, what would be a system of industrial labor relations in China that uh, might be sensible given its uh, political economy and its history. It was a promising period of time, um, and I know there are people on the call who uh, as we did spend time in China, uh, then in a fairly optimistic mood, 
but that changed in 2013 and what we have seen since then has been a very, very uh, steady um, closing down of channels of uh, communication, uh, closing down of opportunities for research, uh, closing down of opportunities for uh, organization and for uh, communication between different groups, between uh, scholars and students and workers and trade unionists. So we now uh, find ourselves at this unusual moment um, of this JASIC struggle, which has had a very, very unusual set of conditions for it uh, that have not been seen in China for many, many years, which is that uh, uh, university students from elite universities, prestigious universities in various parts of the country who had begun to recognize uh, that the official ideology, the Marxist uh, ideology of the state actually was inconsistent with their understanding as they started to read Marx themselves and also to look around the country and notice the inconsistencies between the ideology and what was actually happening to workers. And not surprisingly, we've seen this happen many times in history, uh, uh, students become ideologically woken up um, and they go to work in factories, they meet workers and they join into their struggles uh, in ways that are both supportive and also to try and help them develop their tactics uh, for struggle. Uh, so that happened here. The result was, as you will hear in more detail, um, that there was a um, fierce, fierce crackdown by the state, uh, both uh, against the workers at the JASIC factory and against the students who had taken, who had taken up their cause. Um, I'll just finish by saying there have been solidi solidarity efforts ongoing uh, since that time. Um, we have felt, as we often feel uh, in, in working in these ways in China, uh, somewhat helpless uh, to try and make an impact. This is a very competent and very powerful authoritarian state does not want to see any alliance between students and workers and will intervene to prevent that. So with that, um, I'm going to turn this over uh, to Michael and Michael ask you to just give us uh, the facts of the case and help people understand the, the sequence and uh, um, who has been affected and in what ways. And again, for people who joined late, I'm sorry, Michael Ma works with uh, an organization in Hong Kong, where he is uh, joining us, uh, called Students uh, and Scholars Against Corporate Misbehavior, or SACOM. Michael, thanks so much. Cool. Thanks, Ellen, for um, doing the introduction. I hope I'm speaking loud enough because um, there are, you know, so many participants in this um, webinar, and I'm so surprised that uh, people from all over the world are uh, concerning this issue and also uh, wanting to pay uh, attention and also show support of this very uh, progressive and devoted students and workers who defend for basic workers' rights in China. So uh, like as uh, Alan mentioned, I'm going to talk about the case like specifically and also talk about some of our observation during our period of support and uh, concerns of this issue. So like, first of all, Jason is a uh, company in Shenzhen, China, in the southern part of China. Um, so Jason is a company that make uh, welders uh, for giant like companies, for example, like shipbuilders, for steel uh, machines, for boilers, and other, you know, giant um, uh, industrial use uh, purpose. So the company has been having a uh, very mean management in their factory in China, uh, in, in Shenzhen, China. Workers have been having a lot of um, complaint, but before the J6 struggle in 2018 happened, uh, there were not like very large scale um, struggle or labor strike happened in the, in the uh, company before. So this, uh, this J6 struggle happened in May 2018 from a group of workers who tried to unionize themselves. So uh, the group of workers were having a lot of complaint in the company 
and they were trying to settle this problem by setting up a trade union under the framework of the uh, official legal ACAP Chinese single trade union system. So they asked for the permission of the higher level, the district level trade union, and the, uh, the district level trade union did approve their request and allowed them to form the trade union, to start forming the trade union in the factory. So the workers in the factory start um, you know, collecting signature, trying to organize the first workers uh, congress in order to set up a uh, trade union that truly represent the workers. Unfortunately, this act alerted the management of the factory and very soon the management of the factory start trying to build up a yellow trade union that, you know, of course, uh, for the interests of the uh, company instead of the workers. And this act was later recognized by the district trade union. The district trade union betrayed the workers and said like, um, I didn't let you to organize your own trade union. So the workers who attempted to form the trade union were, uh, were fired. And they, of course, didn't give up. They, they started having protests and also a lot of like, speeches outside the factories. But later on, many of them were arrested by the local government. So since then, uh, a lot of uh, students from top universities in China, including Peking University, Renmin University, Peking Language Universities, and else, more than 16 universities with more than a dozen of uh, university students uh, launched a petition to support these workers who tried to unionize. And also, a, uh, um, they call that like J6 support group, a physical support group were formed in Shenzhen. Students uh, from all over the country and also workers from surrounding area arrived at the area of the J6 factory to form the support group in order to you know, support these workers who tried to defend for their basic workers' rights. So the um, support group have was in size of like uh, 100 people composed of students, workers, and also some other uh, activists from you know, different parts of the country. So uh, they started to gather and started to do a lot of online publishing and also online mobilizing. More and more people were concerned and I learned about this issue and many people have shown the support. So this, you can imagine, definitely make the government feel uncomfortable because the network is so large and also they are, their mobilizing ability was so strong. They can mobilize people from all over the country. Um, so uh, in 24th of August, they faced, the J6 support group faced the first crackdown and mass arrest or tolerance, we would say. So at midnight, that was at around like 1 a.m. when uh, the group of uh, supporting members were uh, resting in the house. The riot police broke the door, broke into the house and arrest more than 50 uh, students, workers, and also other supporters. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so uh, since many of these uh, support group members are from universities and they're actually from those student groups, Marxist Students Society and also other students labor group in the universities. Um, despite the frontline crackdown, these universities are, uh, groups are also facing a lot of suppression in the campus. For example, they were having difficulties uh, to um, renew their uh, uh, society uh, registration. And also uh, many students uh, activists and many students executive members were, um, were having lots of difficulties uh, when they have class or when they were summoned by the uh, management of the university and they have like hours and hours of talk telling them not to go to Shenzhen anymore and not to make travel, you know, quote unquote travel anymore. So uh, this, uh, this, um, this crackdown uh, continued until early November, until another wave of arrest uh, happened. So uh, in early November, more than 50 um, unionists 
official workers in the ACFP, the single trade union in China, and some uh, workers in the uh, workers center uh, around J6 factory, graduate students who supported the workers, and also some other activists were arrested in different cities of China because of their participation in the JSEC uh, struggle. So you can imagine like the government were having a waste. They know that you are supporting the workers and it's not just because you are now, you're currently in Shenzhen, but because you have participated, they know you and they found you in your home country, uh, in your hometown, I mean. So uh, this is the second crackdown the activists faced and um, after that, uh, more and more students were having trouble in the university. Uh, one of the leading Marxist group in the university, which is the Peking University Marxist Society, were falsely reformed by the, by the, by the uh, university. The university uh, falsely changed all the executive member of the student group, replaced the original one with some new one who can be controlled by the university and also those new ones have never been participating in the uh in the marxist society but instead have been harassing the original marxist society members uh, because of the university order so after the reform of the um falsely reform of the marxist society uh a student called Zhang Zhengzheng uh, who supported the JSEC workers were uh, expelled from the university. And also a lot of students were um, summoned uh, and forced to watch a confession video, quote unquote confession video of those activists who were arrested earlier. So the activists who were arrested earlier uh, in the video uh, said that they were, um, they, they, they feel so regret about what they did. They think that the country uh, has been doing very good, has been trying very hard to settle the workers' problem. Say like um, they didn't, um, they didn't understand what they do and they were influenced by others influenced by some group of people who have political agenda, blah, 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 like that. So these activists were forced to make confession uh, in front of the camera, and then the authorities using this video to persuade or to threaten other student activists outside to stop, you know, the whole campaign. Um, and because of this, uh, like, very annoying video, a group of students, uh, they um, secretly record the whole uh, confession video and also uh, translated it uh, into English and published it. And soon the students were uh, arrested as well on 21st of uh, January. So uh, like up till now, there are still more than uh, 40 people uh, being detained because of this issue, 40 uh, students and 40 workers. Um, <coughs> So uh, this is like the basic timeline of the issue. Uh, if you're interested, you can actually go to uh, a Facebook page that uh, set up by an organization called uh, Global Support for Disappeared Leftist Activists in China. And you can see an information pack which presents very clearly the timeline and the whole issue. Um, so I, I was talking about the fact, but uh, uh, this is actually uh, a very uh, unique and important labor rights issue happened in recent China. And I would like to talk about some of our observation and some of our um, analysis of this issue. So first of all, I would talk about like, how is it different from um, some previous labor struggle happened in the Southern China, the period of the Delta. So first of all, a very unique feature of this J6 struggle is that it is very local. It was initiated within China. Previously, a lot of labor struggle have in Pure and Delta were um, having some involvement from uh, Hong Kong NGO. Because a lot of Hong Kong NGO have been doing a lot of groundwork uh, in Pure and Delta, setting up uh, trade 
I mean, like uh, worker center, setting up different um, community center that support workers uh, in, you know, in labor struggle or in like injury cases or in other different kind of labor issue. So previously, a lot of labor struggle in Prior for Delta have a uh, background or have an association of Hong Kong NGO, but this time the GXX struggle is a very local thing. It got the support from local students, local workers, the involvement of uh, Hong Kong NGO like SACOM and other supporting Hong Kong NGO happened very late, relatively. <coughs> and also we are not, you know, in the very core of the decision-making team. We are supporting, but the whole thing was initiated and functioned by um, by the local Chinese, mainland Chinese uh, activists. Secondly, just like what Alan has mentioned, um, the association of workers and students in this JSEC struggle was very, very strong. I would say this has a uh, background that this uh, progressive student groups in universities have been doing very great work for uh, for about a decade. So, uh, for example, the Marxist uh, Society in Peking University, they have been organizing different activities, uh, including reading groups, including uh, visit, and also they have been doing investigation in their university for their backup uh, cleaning attendants or security guards in their campus. They have been working together to uh, actually walk into the community of the workers. And also, uh, in the summer break, they always do um, undercover factory investigation or in, uh, factory um, experience. They work in the factory as in the ordinary workers. They apply and work in the factory as ordinary, uh, ordinary workers, and then they uh, record what they see in the factory. They, um, they, they try to feel how, it, how it is, it's like to be a frontline factory workers even though they are very elite, they, they are from very elite universities. So uh, these students have been doing a lot of work with their um, campus workers, and also they know a lot of workers from the factory, and according to what we know, they also know some workers personally in the JSEC factory. So the association <laughs> because of their previous, earlier, very good uh, work. And also, uh, the, another uh, observation is that, uh, I mean, like, difference is that uh, this time they are having a very strong ideology. They are having a very strong Marxist ideology. And you can see that from their uh, language, from their promotion, from their mobilizing materials, they always ask to compare uh, the workers' situation, the workers' social status, the workers' material status back then in the earlier socialist state of China and nowadays. They ask why, if you say China is a socialist state, why are workers nowadays having such a poor working condition, poor social status? And when they try to unionize themselves according to the law, totally complying with the law, why are they facing all this crackdown from the, from the state, from the government, <coughs> while the you know, the capitalists, while the, while the companies are having so many privileges in the, in, the, in the country, receiving all the tax reduction, receiving all the benefits in all different uh, aspects. So uh, these are some differences of uh, the J6 struggle compared to previous worker struggle in Pure for Delta. And lastly, I would like to talk about uh, some economic background of this struggle. So this struggle didn't pop up from nowhere. We always believe that it is happening uh, under a macro background of the Chinese economic development. So many of you might know that um, the Chinese economic development have slowed down in recent mm -hmm. years. A lot of factories have moved to either uh, Southeast Asia, for example, especially for the garment industry or for the toy making industry or the lighter, lighter industry, they moved to Southeast Asia, like Vietnam, Indonesia, and other countries. And on the other hand, some other manufacturers, they moved to inland China, like Sichuan, Zhengzhou, etc., etc., like Foxconn, Quanta, other uh, electronics factory. So uh, the factories that 
that remain in Shenzhen are having a very difficult time to extrapolate to survive. And the government also understands this. So in this very difficult economic uh, condition, the government and the company are very conscious that they, can, they, they are not able to afford a uh, better working condition of workers that imply a, a higher labor cost. And also they are uh, definitely not happy to see the labor activism is going stronger and more powerful in the area. So, uh, excuse me. <coughs> so uh, when the uh, workers and students start going together, especially when the students are having such a large, flexible, powerful national network that are able to mobilize a lot of students and workers to Shenzhen in a very, very short period of time. This definitely alerted the government and make them very, very worried because you can imagine that today this happened in Shenzhen and they can mobilize hundreds of students to support these workers. Things happen in Tianjin, in Shanghai, in different cities tomorrow. The students can still mobilize these people and they're going to, and, and it's going to accumulate because when, if the students and the workers have the first successful experience, they will definitely gain more confidence and they're definitely going to do more and more work, attract more and more people to involve in this activism. Totally what we want to see, but totally not the government want to see. So what they have to crack down the students and workers at the very beginning. So we can see that uh, in this J6 struggle, uh, the number of arrestees is very, very large. The period of arrest uh, of the detain de detention is very, very long. And also the students outside nowadays are still facing a lot, a lot of suppression and trouble from the university, from their own parents, and also from the government. Students like Zhang Zhengzhen were expelled, which is extremely, extremely rare before. Student activists are usually um, relatively safe and protected. So, and, and also we know that not only Zhang Zhengzhen, but a lot of other students are having a lot of trouble now outside, the, outside inside the universities. And also the government uh, apparently very obviously have ordered the university to suppress the student organizations inside the university because the student organizations has freed too many excellent student activists and also labor activists. And also we can see that uh, the crackdown is not only uh, on the JSEC uh, supporting group, but also if you have uh, read the news, uh, five other activists who have never participated in the J6 struggle, but they have, uh, have been doing very good work in the Peripha Delta area to support collective bargaining, including Wu Weijun, Zhang Ziyu, and a few other labor activists were also arrested and detained till now, uh, since January. This work, uh, uh -huh. this, this, this labor activist did not participate in the J6 struggle, but they were still detained at this point. We believe that it is because the government is really alert because of the J6 struggle, and they want to eliminate any potential risk, potential harm in their eye before anything happens. The government understand that during the economic downturn, they cannot stop the workers from organizing strike or uh, you know, like uh, organizing a struggle because this is natural. You can't stop them because they are, they are workers. They just struggle because they have difficult time. But they can, I mean, the government can stop the activists from escalating the struggles. So they have to control the most influential, the most active activists at this point before anything's happened. Michael, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to stop you there so we can um, have enough time for the, the rest of the discussion tonight, but that was a superb job at packing in uh, a lot of important detail about these struggles. Um, I, I just will take a minute to raise one question that came up in conjunction uh, with your presentation. Has Shenmeng Yu been 
released and is she safe? This is one of the leading activists from the Marxist student group and the answer is no, she has not been released and there's no reason to believe that she's safe. Uh, for those of you who joined us late, we've just heard from Michael Ma with uh, SACOM Students and Scholars Against Corporate Misbehavior in Hong Kong, who's been playing a very critical leading role in the solidarity work in this campaign. And now we're going to turn it over to uh, Eli Friedman, a professor at the uh, Labor School at Cornell, whose field of specialty is Chinese labor, and he's going to talk a bit about the response um, that has emerged uh, to these events. <clears throat> Thank you, and uh, I first want to thank Labor Notes um, for for taking us on. It's it's a really um, it, it's great that we can reach uh, so many people um, all over the world uh, on this very important issue. I'm going to keep it extremely brief uh, so we can have more time to focus uh, on Q and A. Um, but I just want to emphasize um, to begin with why I think international solidarity is particularly important for this movement, uh, and, and the reason, as we've already heard, is that the JSEC conflict has become extremely sensitive within China and it cannot be discussed on the internet. It can, you know, it, perhaps in, in private conversations, people can express uh, their views, um, but there have been students who've been expelled from university, who've been kidnapped, uh, literally just, you know, thrown in the back of cars and disappeared um, simply for expressing their views on this, even for people who didn't uh, um, actively participate in the movement in Shenzhen. Um, so, it is impossible for people there uh, to speak up uh, about it. Now, if, you know, of course we are all, uh, well, I, I presume most of the people watching anyway are, are outside of mainland China. Um, although if there are uh, participants from mainland China, then, then I, I welcome all of you. Um, when we think about uh, sort of pressure points, um, there are, they are few and far between. Um, as we've already heard, the, the trade union in China is not a genuine trade union, um, and there are very there are not substantive international trade union uh, links. Um, the employer, a JSIC Technology, certainly doesn't care. They're not um, they're not vulnerable to sort of you know naming and shaming a type of campaign. Um, the Chinese government is is pretty resistant. Um, I think that there are that we should make efforts uh, to to try to pressure them, um, but we don't have um, a lot of uh, sort of measures, sort of course of measures that we can take against the Chinese government. Um, so I think we should pursue those to the extent that they exist, um, but they're, they're kind of limited in scope. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, we've noticed that universities uh, present a, a potentially interesting point um, of leverage. Um, and I'm speaking now uh, sort of from personal experience, but some of you may have, have heard about a step that uh, Cornell's School of Industrial and Labor Relations took uh, this past fall to suspend a student exchange program we had with Renmin University uh, in Beijing. And we did that in response to the university's ongoing uh, repeated and egregious violations uh, of their students' academic freedom, going so far as to actually um, be complicit in, in a kidnapping of their own student. Um, when we suspended um, that relationship, and I'm not going to give details about it, I'd be happy to go into that in the Q&A. When we suspended um, that relationship, it generated a major response in China. And it's difficult to get um, the Chinese government and, and the media to actually respond, but that happened. So the, the state media had to write an article about it. Uh, they responded to it by saying that we were actually following um, the lead of Donald Trump, which um, my colleagues found pretty amusing. Um, but uh, the minister, uh, Ministry of Foreign uh, Affairs had to address it, um, and they were clearly uh, quite concerned. And, and I think that the reason that they um, were concerned is this. Um, universities in China, particularly elite universities, uh, such as uh, Renmin University, uh, Peking University, Nanjing University, those are some of the places that have been most repressive uh, towards left-wing students who are involved in the JSIC case and other forms of, of labor activism. Um, they're under a lot of they have sort of competing imperatives right now. One of those imperatives is to maintain ideological control, and that's why they are cracking down on their students. The other imperative that they have is to become so-called world-class institutions and to internationalize, to develop closer ties and more substantive ties with foreign universities. Um, but there's a tension there because these universities are continually, continuously and repeatedly um, contradicting the values of other universities, right, which is at least, you know, 
univer most universities outside of China have to at least um, claim fidelity to things like academic freedom, even if they themselves don't always uh, protect it. So I think that there's a possibility to kind of put pressure on this tension between Chinese universities uh, imperative to, for political control and to internationalize. Um, um, and try to push them to either stop repressing their students or to pay some sort of um, symbolic price. You know, I want to also just note that direct worker to worker solidarity, uh, of course, would be wonderful um, and would presumably be the foundation of any uh, more transformative movement. I think in the current conditions, um, it's unfortunately extremely uh, unlikely to be able to develop those, although we should, um, where those sorts of possibilities exist. Um, we do think um, that you, you know, unions um, outside of China have some limited capacity. They can't call the ACFTU um, and get a response, most likely. Um, but there may be other ways that they can exercise power symbolically or that they can contact a university or government um, contacts that they have outside of China and use that to sort of mobilize um, some sort of pressure. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that, again, in the interest of time. Um, and I, I believe that Michael is going to talk about some concrete uh, action possibilities, um, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Michael, somehow you, yeah, uh, you, oh, have gotten, you have gotten sideways. I don't know how that happened, but. Yeah, so. Um... Yeah, thanks, Eli, for uh, introducing what he has been doing. Very great work. And uh, just like what Eli has mentioned, we believe that the universities in China are now playing a very important role, not only because they are still tracking down the students' activists inside the university, but also we want to guarantee that uh, this uh, students organizes, uh, organizations and also societies in the university that breed a lot of elite activists and also very progressive activists uh, would have a space to survive in the future. So uh, despite a lot of work, uh, you know, uh, Eli and also other uh, people in the academia have been doing in the in the campus, we also like to invite you, every one of you who participate in this webinar, to send an email to the uh, education department of the Chinese government because this uh, department is, you know, like the um, higher level management of the Peking University, Lemming University, and other universities, they're national universities. So we would like you to send an email to the department, tell them not to suppress, not to crack down the students' activists anymore, and they should stop expelling the student activists. Student activists have no guilt supporting the workers. We have drafted the email, uh, I think, then uh, is going to help sending the link out. You just have to fill in your name, your, uh, for example, your university or your organization to show who are you. Then we can pressure the government to um, at least open up some space for the activists inside China, while a lot of people are doing more institutional effort uh, in different parts of the world. Thank you so much. Um, we have been some answering some questions as they've come along. I just want to point out that uh, Rich Applebaum, who is a uh, labor academic in California, I believe it's Santa Barbara, uh, asked, uh, how is it possible to more effectively or to effectively use uh, lists or networks that we have of labor academics? And um, I think based on the experience uh, that Eli described, that I'm sorry, the experience that Eli described between Cornell, Cornell and Renmin University. Uh, if you are an academic yourself, if you are in academic networks um, and you have colleagues that have direct uh, relationships, programs or shared research projects uh, with Chinese universities um, and you can send a letter of inquiry or a letter of censure or a letter of uh, criticism, um, the, the main universities that Michael mentioned uh, that have been involved are the primary targets. Uh, and we can, we can list those again for you. But it's not unreasonable if you have a relationship uh, with a, a Chinese academic or an academic program to say, we have heard of this uh, suppression of, of uh, academic freedom, suppression of students in other universities, and ask them to comment on it. 
Okay, um, other questions. Um, uh, Michelle Chen asked uh, Michael if you can uh, answer this question, given the rollbacks on free expression and other civil liberties in Hong Kong, has SACOM itself faced any pressures in terms of its solidarity campaign and advocacy from Hong Kong? And are there tensions around the safety of Hong Kong based, uh, Hong Kong -based activists who are in contact with or traveling to work with mainland peers? Um, thanks, Michelle. A, a very good question. Um, well, first of all, I would have to point out that the shield uh, Hong Kong has, or Hong Kong had, uh, is not as uh, effect, uh, effective or not as powerful as before. You might have heard about the Causeway Bay bookstore uh, incident, that a bookstore uh, owner who has been publishing some uh, books that uh, criticize the Chinese government were um, kidnapped in China, and also a Swedish citizen called Wei Minghai were kidnapped in Thailand uh, because of this Causeway Bay bookstore issue as well by the Chinese government. I mean, kidnapped by the Chinese government. So uh, it shows that Hong Kong is not. 100% safe anymore, and we are very conscious about that. So far, because of this basic struggle, we did not uh, face any uh, physical assault yet, but we have received some call from the national security asking, uh, why are you doing all this media work? Why are you organizing all these uh, solidarity campaigns and else? Um, they didn't you know, explicitly tell you to stop, but we know that, you know, we are on the list. Um, but so far, we are still, uh, like, working on the campaign, and we believe that um, the space is still there, but we definitely have to be careful, because we can see that uh, the rule previous, the, the previous rules are not 100% effective anymore. Previously, student activists inside the university current students are safe. They would not be expelled because of what they do, but now they're expelled. And we would not think Hong Kong activists staying in Hong Kong 100% safe anymore. Michael, thank you. Um, <clears throat> there have been several questions about uh, JSIC itself, uh, its ownership and its relationship to the Chinese government, and also the skill levels of the workers. Anybody like to comment on that? Um, yeah, I've, I've uh, read the questions. Um, so first of all, the skill level of the workers, I would say uh, uh, the, the, the skill level is still quite slow. I mean, the workers are not like te technicians or very experienced uh, in certain, um, you know, skills uh, aspect. So they are ordinary workers, ordinary frontline workers receiving um, like close to the basic wage for their minimum wage. Uh, I mean, close to the minimum wage for their basic wage. Uh, and the relationship of the uh, JSEC company to the government, first of all, this is a private company, so this is not a state-owned company. However, the owner of the company, who is called Panley, he is a representative of the Shenzhen City People Congress, so more or less he can still stay, he's an official, and also the, uh, the head of the HR department, who is called uh, Guo Li Chang, is a representative of the District People Congress. Uh, I will have to point out that this, you know, these positions are in relatively quite a, uh, not a significant position, but still you can see uh, they are having some relationship with the government. But we don't think this is the major or the core reason why uh, the company can uh, or the, the, the issue is so sensitive in the eye of the government. We don't think it is because it, it is just because the workers are touching the, uh, the, the benefit or the interest of, of their boss who is a official, but instead because of the student organizing is so powerful itself.
We have had a question about uh, why has the ILO case been delayed? Uh, so, uh, fortunately, uh, ICTU, the, the International Trade Union, has, uh, has filed uh, the J6 struggle as part of the uh, crackdown of the organizing in China. However, because of the uh, very complicated procedure and also the very busy uh, agenda of ILO, uh, the ILO Committee of Freedom of Association still have not got the time to read relative materials so far. So uh, if things go well, uh, they can reveal the materials in March, so in next week, uh, in next month. And um, if things go well earliest, uh, the, the uh, intimate report will be issued in coming November. I know Chinese government will have to respond to the report in coming November. So uh, it will not be happening very soon. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> there have been a number of questions about uh, what are the kinds of tactics that we would consider to be effective in this period of time. Um, I, I, I think that our best understanding is, uh, this is a two-part answer. One is, what are the tactics that might be effective? We only know based on seeing response, and the only tactic that has shown any response so far from the government was when the relationship was severed between Cornell and Renmin University. And it elicited an incredibly strong response, which is why some of us think that focusing on this question of academic relationships is so important. Uh, as we know, most universities in the US now have some kinds of partnership programs of some sort with Chinese universities. It is uh, beneficial. Uh, to students in both countries. It's beneficial to investors in both countries. Um, these relationships they'd like to maintain, I believe that they will be sensitive if this was to a trend that would spread. So we, I think we encourage people to pay attention to this. Um, see whether academics that you know have, have partnerships or are aware of them on universities and send letter, begin to send inquiries to their counterparts in the Chinese universities. Um, there have been some suggestions uh, put into the chat group. I think what I would say about those is that the second criteria about what is effective is what are we able to do? Uh, the solidarity movement outside of China is uh, very small. Um, there are limited numbers of people that are paying attention to this issue yet. And so we need to take realistically how we can apply our, um, our density and our influence. Um, I'm going to go to some other questions. Um, um, somebody wants to know whether it is possible to conduct a social audit on the JSIC company from buyer companies under the global value chain. Would anybody like to respond to that? Um, I guess I can uh, share a little bit. So uh, despite the uh, supporting of JSIC struggle, sometimes, you know, our daily, our ordinary work has to do undercover investigation in different factories, including Foxconn, including the factories of H&M, Sarah, and also other uh, international leading um, brands. Uh, so like, first of all, we, we think that uh, social auditing is usually not very effective because there are too many loopholes that the company and the factories can, can use to hide their problems. Uh, we have received multiple reports that the auditors are, um, are not, were, were, were not seeing what the daily operation are. They were showed another phase of the factory. The workers are warned not to tell the truth. Workers are given model answers and else. So we don't think social auditing, we have not, we, we, we have been saying that social auditing is not an effective way. And um, so we feel like undercover investigation is always much better. But in this case, we don't think um, the investigation in the factory is that important at this stage anymore because the situation, the work 
pain condition in the factory is very obvious because we have a lot of workers who have been working in the factory for a long period of time. We know how poor is the factory. But the problem now the students and workers are facing are not from the factory, it is from the government. So uh, I don't think, I, I think it's beyond the factory level. Connected to that, a, a question was asked about um, what it means to the labor movement and to the organized uh, student groups uh, that, that there has been change in the two-term limit. This is the two-term limit for the president of China and the broader agenda of Xi Jinping in comparison with other more recent uh, chairmen. Uh, my question is directed to the state rhetoric or is there a total suppression of any opposition even within the CCP? I think that is probably beyond the scope of our call, but um, if either of you would like to comment, certainly it has had a chilling effect. Yeah, go ahead. I think that, that there's um, a couple relevant points. The first is, is that it is an indicator of a broader sort of a hard authoritarian turn uh, on Xi Jinping, right? And it's never been a liberal democracy, but it, is, it has hardened quite significantly um, over the past couple of years against workers, against students, against feminists, against lawyers, and of course there's the mass internment uh, of Uyghurs um, and other, um, other minorities in Xinjiang. So across the board, there's been a hardening and I think <coughs> the elimination of uh, term uh, limits is, is, is an indicator of that. But one of the things that I do think is relevant um, for us um, is that part of this hard repressive turn has been framed in ideological terms is about reinforcing Marxism and about reinforcing socialism. And I think that one of the reasons that they have been that they've cracked down so hard on these students is because it reveals their, the Communist Party's Marxism to be a complete farce. And so it makes them look really bad. So one of the other things that has happened internationally that that has elicited something of a response, I think, uh, was a boycott of the World Marxism Conference, which is a conference uh, held, uh, it has been held twice in China. They're planning another one at some point in the future. Um, and, and some of us on this call and others have helped to organize a boycott where we got prominent uh, leftists to sort of preemptively say, we're boycotting this conference because your version of Marxism um, is, uh, is false it is, and it is against the interest of the working class, which is pretty basic to you know, most understandings of Marxism. We got some very prominent people to sign on to that, uh, including uh, David Harvey, Slavoj Zizek, uh, Noam Chomsky, um, and that you know, definitely made uh, something of an impact. So I think that for, um, for those of us in terms of thinking about strategy, um, pointing out, it, it, it leaves them somewhat vulnerable in terms of thinking about you know, what is Marxism, what is socialism, um, and, and I think that that does provide at least a rhetorical opening for us and for other sort of, uh, you know, leftists around the world. Thank you, uh, Eli. There is a question now um, about the ACFTU. ACFTU is part of the WFTU, which also includes some unions that are both members of the ICFTU and WFTU. For people that don't know, this is historically the trade union federations um, WFTU were from the communist countries, ICFTU from the capitalist countries. Are there any possible unions that would lend their good offices to communicate on this issue? And has the ACFTU taken any separate public position that is separate from the government and or the party on this issue? I ask because from working in Vietnam, we sometimes saw diversity of opinions existing, but they are not usually publicly expressed. Anybody like to, either of you like to address that? I think I can share a bit about what I saw, and maybe uh, I'm not sure like Eli, I, I'm sure that he has a more all-round observation. So uh, the ACFTU, the ACFTU uh, has a double uh, goals or identity. Uh, some people always say that ACFTU is useless. They never think of thought about workers' rights. I don't, I don't actually, uh, agree that they never think about workers. They do think about workers, but also on the other hand, it is a party's entity. It has another uh, mission. It has another uh, uh, aim or a higher aim that it has to maintain the stability of the party and the country. So when these two uh, goals have uh, contradiction or have crashed, they 
to rate the stability of the party or the state <coughs> in the right. Like previously, we can see that um, since uh, like earlier uh, years of this decade, uh, the uh, Shenzhen Trade Union has tried to introduce some reform uh, or has tried to uh, promote the collective bargaining. But after uh, like the step down of that very specific trade union leader, um, the whole trial or the whole reform um, uh, concept were uh, revoked. And also, uh, you know, it is much more conservative now. I think it is first of all because of the step down of the former trade union leader. And also, uh, on the other hand, it is because of the downturn of the economic development. But uh, when it comes to very specifically, Currently, is there any uh, trade union inside the ACFD framework that are willing to uh, speak out for the JSIC workers? No, there's not. So I, I would uh, just just like very last part, and yeah, uh, you know, where three uh, workers in the trade union in the ACFD trade union were arrested because they tried to help the workers, and you can see what's the result of if you are inside the ACFD and you come to help the workers. So, yes, no, I, I just wanted to add that final point um, and just to emphasize that, that there were two local level officials uh, within the trade union structure who, who were arrested. And, and, you know, that was a way of the government indicating that um, they had made a mistake, in essence, by initially telling the workers that they could hold a union election because they, they had done that and then they reversed their position. And that's when things really uh, sort of intensified. So, um, you know, there are apps, you know, as in Vietnam, there are absolutely lots of people in the ACFT who see what's going on and they don't like it, but institutionally, they're not in a position where they can speak out publicly on it. So I can tell you with 100% certainty, nobody at the national level leadership, nobody at the provincial level leadership in Guangdong is going to openly speak out against. <laughs> Oh, I'm afraid Eli has... Oh, go ahead. You still have me? Yes, you froze up for a minute, but please continue. So if, you know, if there's anyone uh, who has uh, connections to, to unions or to, the, you know, international union federations that have linkages to the ACFTU, you absolutely should make your position be known. It's important that they hear that this is a problem and that you see what's happening and that their silence speaks volumes. But really all you can do in this instance, I think, is to make a sort of, is to make a statement, but you can't go in with any expectation that they're going to actually do anything about it because they're structurally incapable of, of doing anything about this particular case. I think we will uh, wrap up maybe with this final question. Uh, is there any sense of solidarity across the various movements uh, for worker and human rights on the mainland since the government's recent attack on many different groups appeared to be escalating uh, from the crackdown in Xinjiang to suppression of feminist protesters to clampdowns on the press, et cetera, are labor groups aligned with or collaborating with other types of activism? Um, I think I can answer that one pretty easily? The answer is no. It is very, very dangerous for anybody to link up or any groups to link up. Uh, that's precisely why the government has become so enraged about the connection between the students and the workers. So this is, um, we appreciate you raising the point, uh, labor suppression is not the only form of suppression of civil liberties uh, and human rights going on in China by any means, but it is not possible for the um, the victims of this repression uh, connect with one another tragically. Um, we have uh, reached one hour, a couple of minutes uh, over. Um, let me just sum up by saying uh, that we will uh, follow up. Uh, we will send out to people who are uh, registered for the call um, a, a list of resources that have come up here. Um, both background information about JSIC, uh, various websites that are carrying uh, uh, news and also solidarity efforts, and we'll welcome you uh, to join those. Um, once again, to uh, invite any of you who are interested in keeping in touch with us, uh, please do so. Um, I'll give you the name. Uh, um, you can write to uh, 
uh, and DiMaggio, who has been our um, uh, who has been our moderator here, or our technical moderator, I mean. Um, if you would like to get in touch with any of us and don't know how to do that directly, uh, please send your inquiry to Dan and he will get it to us. Um, we want again, once again want to thank uh, both Michael. Uh, I hope everyone appreciates the, the risky nature of the work that he and others in Stockholm and in Hong Kong are doing. They feel the very, very uh, serious threat very close by to them, and this is this is a, an act of enormous courage uh, to do this work. Um, thank you, Eli. I think the example of taking an institutional step um, uh, and showing that there is there are some consequences uh, to the actions the Chinese government takes has been incredibly important. Uh, Labor notes. Thank you again for providing this platform. Thanks everybody for joining us tonight and uh, let's let's try and stay in touch. Good night. <laughs>